Hello. Welcome to Teaching Artistry with Courtney J. Body. That's me. This is a podcast that celebrates artists and advocates for community engagement. And this is We Can't Go Back, a video series in partnership with Creative Generation meant to examine, interrogate, and confront racist policies and systems in the arts. This series amplifies leaders in arts and culture who drive radical change in communities through an anti-racist and liberatory practices. Subscribe to the Teaching Art Issue with Courtney J. Body YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Now, I live in Brooklyn on the lands of the Lenape and Canarsie nations, but I'm currently recording this on the eastern end of Long Island on the lands of the Unkachug. I identify as a Black cisgendered woman who pays respect and uplifts my ancestors from across the African diaspora in the US and beyond. I also pay respect and uplift the indigenous diaspora that is woven into my history and DNA through a network of solidarity and love from the Cherokee, Creek, and Uchi nations. So let's get started. Let's welcome our guest, Michael J. Bobbitt. Hi, Michael. Hi, Courtney. How are you? It's good to be here. I'm so happy to have you. Uh, I absolutely adore you. Uh, so thanks for joining me. Can you tell us what our, your role in arts and arts education is and, and how do you embed anti-racist practices into your work? Sure. Um, before we do that, do you mind if I do a little bit of um, land acknowledgement as well? Absolutely. Please do. Um, we are sitting in Watertown. Um, I'm at the Repertory Theater in Watertown, Maryland, um, Watertown, Massachusetts. And we are, the original people that were here were called Pigs Gusset. Um, they were uh, part of the Pequoset Band of the Massachusetts Tribe. And um, their um, Pigs Gusset means Meadow of the Widening of the River. And it was renamed Watertown. Uh, and I'm all, I also identify as a gay black man, um, gay cisgender black man. Uh, so I just want to put that out there. Um, so my role, uh, my current job is artistic director. Um, and I have been in this capacity at another job prior to this for um, 12 years prior. So uh, I've been in sort of a theater leadership role um, in the last few years. And I've been trying to spread the joy of anti-racism uh, all over the country. Actually, tomorrow morning, I have my first international uh, panel conversation about anti-racism. So my national tour is going international. Yay, yay. That's amazing. And, and can you give us some examples? Um, I, you know, I, I've been on a town hall panel with you, which I uh, feel was a part, was very, I felt very honored to have been in the, that particular company. Uh, and I heard you say then that I have been working anti-racism practices into my work for many years. So I'm just curious, you know, what are some concrete examples of how anti-racist practices can be embedded into institutions and maybe talk a little bit about your own experience in, in these, uh, this work, either at where you are working or where you have worked. Sure. Yeah, you and I have been in a lot of rooms together, but really haven't had this kind of chance to sort of get to know each other and bond. So I'm so glad this is happening. I like to start by saying to people that I believe this work, anti-racism, anti-oppression, equity, diversity, inclusion, whatever name you want to put on it, um, is truly an act of love. We are showing love to people who have not been loved in this country ever, ever. And I like to think of this as we're, we're trying to end a race war, not start a race war. And I think many people think it's the opposite. I do think that the theater industry has been pontificating about this work for 20, 30 years. And while we've made some strides in the number of artists that we're seeing on our stage, represented on the stage, either behind the scenes or on stage, we haven't really seen much of a change in our audiences, in our funders. Mm. And that's where I'm focusing my effort. Um, I, you know, most of this field is made up of people who are fantastic at programming and creativity. And maybe where we are struggling, maybe where we, the reason why we haven't seen much of a change in our um, audiences is because we may need some more help 
on the financial side, on the government side, on the operation side, because that is where the systems really exist that perpetuate racism. The way we budget, the way we build our boards, the power we give to our boards, the, the processes and policies that we have in operations, the processes and policies and the privilege that we, we give to our donors, uh, we often, I mean, in our practice, we give more to people that already have a lot. Think about our donor benefits. The more you give, the more you get. Mm -hmm. A lot of the reasons why you have that much money is because of privilege, unearned opportunities. I'm looking at changing those kinds of systems, and I think that will actually build more of an anti-racist culture in my organization than doing more shows about people of color. That's happening at the same time. I'm certainly working to bring more artists, and I've been doing that kind of work for years, bring more artists on the stage, not only in my theaters, but whenever I work outside of my theaters as a playwright, as a director, as a choreographer. But I think we have been struggling with the operational finance governance side of it all. Yeah, I was in a conversation with you with another executive, and I'm, I'm a programmer, right? And so I often am thinking about what's, you know, either artistic programming or education programming. And I heard you talking about policies and board and operations, and it really sort of uh, clicked in some, something in my head about, you know, when, when you were just talking even just now about the swag, the swag that people get at a gala event because you gave, you know, X amount of dollars to be at this fancy affair um, or um, the idea of, you know, why are we budgeting, you know, years, two years in advance, you know, is there a way to be more responsive to uh, culturally responsive, more responsive if, in terms of how we budget? I would love to just get one like super concrete example of something that you've been able to do as an executive, um, either with a board or within policy or um, something that you'd like to do or working on? I'll talk a little bit about boards. Uh, well, one of the one concrete example is that we are, um, all of our donors are now gonna get the same benefits. So my $25 is just as significant as your, tw your $25,000. So you should get the same benefit of that gift. Um, and that's how we create equity and create an equitable environment. But one of the things I like to think about when it comes to boards, one, I think that this industry has to, well, the whole nonprofit world has to re-examine the power dynamic of nonprofit boards. Um, if you think about it, we have um, transient, and not, not in a bad way, but, but people that come in for a few years and they leave, mm. but relatively transient volunteers that contribute funds and sometimes in proportion to the size of the whole budget, that, that, that contribution is, is not very large. Um, and, and, you know, most boards, I think the average annual board, the average of sort of board giving is 22 to 25% of the annual fund, not the earned revenue, just the right. contributed revenue, 22 to 25% of the contributed revenue but they have ultimate power. They have 100% ultimate power where they can fire the executive director. That's an interesting and a strange power dynamic. And if you go back and look at the 501c3 laws, there's maybe three laws that regulate um, that law, that tax law, which is you can't have less than three people, you have to meet once a year, and you gotta follow your financials. And even if you look at the state laws, there aren't that many more that really regulate how boards function. Boards have just created power mm. over the years. It was founded in 1968 and have made up their own rules for how they want to govern and lead and run organizations. But essentially when boards are making policy, they exist on a bell curve, right? All policies theoretically should exist on a bell curve mm. where you're taking care of most of the people, right? In the center of that understanding that on the ends, some people are going to get screwed, but it's hard to take care of every single person with a policy. A couple of things. One is that if your board is relatively homogenous from one type of person, then who are the people they're taking care of? They're taking care of people that look like them. So that's one reason why you have to diversify your boards because a white board will only see what a white board can see. It won't see the whole picture. A diverse board will see the whole picture. 
typically when that is happening, even though it, it's supposed to be on a bell curve, it's not really looking like a bell curve. It's actually looking like a line like this, where you're taking care of the people that already have a lot. And the people that are marginalized are still getting less. So when you have a homogenous board, your policy exists like this, where you're taking care of most of the people that look just like the board, and you're not taking care of the people that look that are already marginalized. So policies now to take care of the people that are not being taken care of should do the opposite. The people that have, that can get what they need elsewhere should not be taken care of as much as we're taking care of them. To me, that, that harkens back to the love that you were talking about, right? That's hard. What you just said is I, I can see it and I love it. But I also have in the back of my head Michael Wiggins saying, like, if people wanted to fix it, they would have fixed it already. They don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. So we started recording. You were saying, you know, I have listed out the, the seven. What is it? The seven. of No, I think that honestly, for me, the racism won't end until white people are willing to give up power. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, go back to like women's right to vote. It wasn't women that got the right to vote. It was white men that chose to give them the right to vote. Um, Think about Jackie Robinson. We were taught that he was the first black person to break the color barrier. He was better than every other black ball player out there, which we know is not true based on stats. There were so many other ball players that were better than him. He was the first black person that was allowed by white people to play in the major leagues which is a different narrative. And racism will end when white people are willing to give up power. And racism is prejudice, social power, and legal authority. And until those two things are are given up, it won't end. Unfortunately, the thing that keeps people from doing that, one is power, power and money, right? The second is this sense of loss. And I I think racism will feel like the loss of a loved one, that energy that you go through when you are grieving the loss of a loved one, I think will be the same for many, many white people. And so I think it's going to be like the seven stages of grief. Uh, And I think a lot of you seeing the stage where there's like disbelief and shock, Mm. like, oh my God, it's true. Like because of COVID-19 and we were all stuck in our homes looking at George Floyd's murder, which became like must-see TV. You couldn't change the channel or close it. You had to watch it. They were like, what? This really is true? It's really happening? So the, the shock of it all, and then they, they, many of them are moving on to the anger stage, but they're, you see it on the news every day. They're fighting and fussing and pushing against it and going back to 1960s kind of like racism, right? Um, and then most people get stuck in, in four, which is depression which is like, I just want to like curl under my cover, put the cover over my head and, and hope it'll disappear. And depression in many ways is not doing stuff, right? So you see a lot of people stuck. You see all of our theater organizations still having not put out their race equity plan, not even a draft of it. They haven't started because they're just so depressed and frozen with fear. But unfortunately that people of color are not going to tolerate it anymore. This is a question. I'm on a lot of blogs. I'm on a lot. I'm in a lot of conversations. I am in a lot of different groups. And that what you just said about um, this sort of getting stuck, right? There's another part of that, that if you take it out of the seven stages of grief, it's also about, you know, not getting it right which is not, it's not possible, uh, but not that that stops people from taking action, right? And we're not going to get it right. I don't know what it is, or I'm too lazy to figure out what it is. Um, then, then, so how, you know, how do you, how, what's the, what's the, besides protests, right? Like, what is the thing that will help move white people or white identifying people past the grief stage? So the first stage is shock and denial, right? Mm-hmm. And then the second stage is pain and guilt, which is why we got all those texts from our friends, right? Checking on us. Uh, And then you get into anger and bargaining, which we're seeing on TV all together, and then depression. 
the that's the hardest one because depression like i said is is not doing anything so sometimes people just feel like if i don't if i don't think about it or if i if i shove it into a little box and it won't actually harm me um you know that's the hard thing because i think that that's the difference in a in changing policy and changing hearts and minds which i which i think of as, as culture culture and policy we can change policy. We can fight and, and rip down statues and protest, which is not sustainable. Like we're going to get tired um, with the hope that we're changing hearts and minds. Changing hearts and minds requires people to be uncomfortable, to push through all the things that they feel like they know, their belief system, to understand that they have been frankly lied to their whole lives by people that they felt and trusted who were also lied to their whole lives. So just recognizing that that is the truth. The truth is different than what I think it is and pushing past it. Action, the opposite of depression is doing something. So those people that just wanted to go away and want to cover up their head or ride it out, it's not going away. So you have to do something. And that's how you'll, and when you do stuff, when you have action, you accomplish something, you'll feel better and better. And then you'll want to do more and more and more. So do something, even if it feels uncomfortable, because you can push past that. Right. Well, none of us have the right to be comfortable when we're yeah. talking about race, right? None of us in this whole country. We, even people of color, are complicit in, in perpetuating it. So there's not one person I can think of in this whole country that has the right to be comfortable when talking about race. Maybe in 100 years when the systems of race are eradicated and race has be become something to be revered, that I, I want to know so much about you because you are a person of color. I want to learn your customs and try your food and try your dances. I want to be who I am, but I want to learn everything I can to learn about who you are and what, you, what your culture is life, like and it's revered. Maybe then in a hundred years when racism is over, we can be comfortable about race. Well, you kind of answered my, my next question, which is about like, what does a, a liberated and racially just world look like. So I love this. I love this concept of revering race, revering black culture, rever not appropriating it, not extracting from it, but revering it and learning and and um, engaging with with people as opposed to pulling it and changing it. Um, uh, so I feel like there's another kind of question I could be asking you. What is it, I wonder? <laughs> uh, but I'm just curious, like, what, what are the other kinds of conversations that you're having um, around this? So I'm asking you specific questions, but, uh, you know, as you're, as you said, we're all complicit in this and your work, you, I know, are working on um, building anti-racism practices and really embedding them into your work and into the work of the institutions that you are running what kinds of um, either challenges or surprises are you coming up against? You know, the things that I'm trying to do um, in attacking the systems and governance are, um, so for, for instance, I, one of the, the, the difficult conversations I'm having with my board is that they're, they're new at the, in their race equity learning. I've been studying this for five years now. They're new at it. Um, and it's a relatively homogenous board. We have a few more people of color coming in uh, we have three now, we have three more, two more coming in, and, and well, actually three more coming in. So one of the conversations was about creating a sort of anti-racism committee. And my fear is that this is not a new practice. Boards have been doing this for the last five years. And it's all performative. It's all checking a box. The ultimate power still lands in the full board. This sort of anti-racism or EDI committee has no real power. They can make recommendations and oftentimes those recommendations are sent to the full board and the full board is uncomfortable so they don't take it. And then all the people of color on your EDI committee leave, right? We usually walk away. We're so worn out from having these conversations, we would walk away. So I said to them, we can create this committee, but not until you give them some power. You have to give them real power. Otherwise, it's gonna be like relegating them to the kiddie table at Thanksgiving. Mm. And so my suggestion was, we have, they have made the rule that one of the action steps is that, that we're going to have equal representation on the board, which I think is amazing. So I said, so what are you going to do in the interim? 
What's our stopgap to keep you from passing a policy that may be racist or not equitable or not inclusive or not diverse? They were like, well, we have this committee and when they make a recommendation, we'll just take it. I went, but I'm telling you, I, I experienced that many, many times. It doesn't work. Now, if you gave them veto power for them to stop a vote, stop a decision of the board that is not rate, that is not anti-racist, that is not, that is, you know, inclusive, diverse and, and uh, equitable, then that's power. That is power. And additionally, it covers your ass because there's two things. One with the call out cancel culture, one mistake. That's all it takes, one mistake. Two, the more inclusive we get, the more exposed we are to our unintended racism. And so having this committee and giving them veto power is a way to protect you from making a mistake. So that's one of the, one of the difficult conversations I'm having. The other conversation I'm having is that we are getting rid of um, racist subscription models. I think they're, one, I think those models are broken not only from a racism point of view, but also from a financial point of view and a marketing point of view. Uh, and it's something this industry has been complaining about for years, yet we haven't taken the time to build a new model. And I, and I think mostly because people are, it's not even that people are afraid of change, it's just the, the cultures are afraid of change. You know, you think about companies like Kodak, who had someone on their staff that came to them and said, hey guys, you should look at this thing I just invented called digital, digital photography. And they were like, no, <laughs> stay forever. And where's Kodak now? It's gone. So the reason why we don't have a new subscription model is because no one's actually taking the time to build it. Um, so I am looking to eradicate it, to come up with a more equitable model where you pay a certain amount of money a month and you get all access to all things, plus maybe benefits at discounts at other organizations. Um, I'm also going to general admission seating. I want everyone to have the chance to sit up front. Some of the controversy is that it's gonna be chaos. And I said to my people that said that, when you go to church and synagogue, is it chaos? No, you just ask, is this he taken? And people will say yes or no. And then you go sit somewhere else. Um, so humans are used to that, but I want everyone to have the chance to sit up front. Hmm. Um, so those kinds of models, I think I can incorporate those in my institution but typically theater goers go see shows at a lot of different places. So if they're experiencing it in my space, one or two things will happen. Either they'll put pressure on other organizations to change their policies, or they'll come back to me and say, I don't like this. I went to this theater and this theater and this theater. They're not doing that. So you have to go back and do something else. So that's one of the concerns I have. So I'm trying to, trying to get funders to to help me beta test these models with a cohort of theaters that are large or small or from around the country that are affinity theaters, that are PWI theaters, and then us to sort of like figure this out and work out the kinks. I feel like there's a study in that too. Somebody should call somebody. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a study in that, right? Oh, I'm sorry, you're talking. I I was going to say some MFA program, just figure out how to study this for us. And then, yeah. That's exciting. Can you just, um, for the, for the listeners who may not know what PWI means? Uh, predominantly white institutions. And I think that's a thing of the past. I don't think we should, should allow those anymore. Mm -hmm. Like Carmen Morgan says, you don't get to be a predominantly white institution anymore. So maybe the new term is predominantly multiracial institution. Um, well, Michael, I could talk to you forever. I, 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 like, I have so many questions, but I'm trying to keep this a tight, tight conversation. Um, so thank you for these really interesting ideas that I, I still, as I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm having a lot of conversations. I'm not, there's some new things here. I'm interested in talking more about that general admission um, only, only because for uh, the school base, it, it is general admission. We don't have tickets, but we end up, it's all about group size and need in terms of students with disabilities or 
um, whatnot, uh, and we have multiple levels, and that's been really, it's really challenging to be as equitable. Like if you've been in the balcony before, we try to make sure that the next time you come, you're in a different spot, but you know, it's, it's a challenge because it's not always the same kids, <laughs> right? So it's, oh, uh, yeah. so I'm curious about that uh, from an education standpoint, but also from a prescription or a subscription, excuse me, um, or membership. Yeah, there's some kinks yeah. to be worked out, and I have my staff looking at um, movie theaters that don't have tiered seating structure, but you can still reserve your seat early. Mm-hmm. It still is first come, first serve, but it goes to everyone at the same time. We're not giving it to subscribers first. We're not giving it to donors first. It goes to everyone at the same time. So we'll see how that works out. Wow. I'm into it. I, I'd love to I'd love to follow up, definitely. And and please, 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 let's keep talking because as I said, I, I really I've always enjoyed, you know, our our interactions, which have been somewhat minimal, but I feel like are are getting closer and closer together. Um, and I feel like I have a lot to learn from you. So thank you so much again for taking the time to be with me and our audience. Anything, any last words that you'd like to say? Oh, I love your your concept of we can't go back because if we do go back the way it is, it is a massive failure. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Michael. And thank you everyone for watching Teaching Artistry with Courtney J. Body. This conversation will also be on our audio podcast. So subscribe to the SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, like Michael said, we won't go back. We can't go back. Onwards. Now is my time to shine. Let's when your time comes, don't postpone it. When others doubt and out, you don't condone it. Truth be told, yourself is your toughest opponent. When your moment comes, grab hold and own it. Never let go, stand tall and hold tight. Overcoming obstacles is the objective in life. Doubters overnight, and onto them you shine bright. Cause inside your head, on goes the light. Ignite.